And he's like, hey, here's a knife. Cut the zip tie over here so I can undo this hose. And so it looked like a dull butter knife. And so it was not. It was not. It was super, super sharp. And it cut through that zip tie like butter. Uh, and then it cut into my hand as well. Oh. Yeah. So I was not expecting that. They can go to the hospital. No, so then we went to three different emergency rooms that would not take uh, the VA care. So under Donald Trump, oh, that. Yeah, under Donald Trump, I was able to go to any hospital and get care. But under a, a Biden, they reneged all those contracts and they drastically reduced them. So now I, there's only certain hospitals I can go to. Care. This is the Farm Hop Life Podcast, a traveling homestead family. I'm Matt DeRosier. On the Farm Hop Life Podcast, we learn what it takes to grow your own food from everyday people. Could be a college student grows tomatoes and salad greens on their apartment patio, a former VP of marketing for Del Taco now raising cattle in Montana, or someone who hasn't had a homestead in over 10 years. This show is aimed at teaching you what it takes to make homesteading work for you, that we all make mistakes, we all have bad days, but we can reach out and help one another thrive in giving you the confidence needed to go feed yourself. We're wondering why there are so many machetes around the property. That the former owner had left. Yeah, the former. Like they're everywhere. Like you go anywhere on the property. Like they're in the house. They're in the coops. The carport. Carport shop. Yeah, like anywhere you go, there's at least like one machete. Normally, there's two. And we uh, we come out to go check out the chickens in the morning, and one of the chickens is wrapped around with a snake around it, and I pull it out. I thought the chicken was dead. I just start cutting up the snake, and the chicken survives still alive of the day. Wow, nice. Is it always a rattlesnake that you find, or no? This was uh, like a gardener snake, uh, gardener gopher snake. Okay. Yeah. Or the what they, they call it a rat snake in Texas, right? So like, so you guys did you guys move there last year? or Was that this year? So we moved up here this year. We we were out of Texas. This is 2018. And then for that, I lived in El Paso, Las Cruces for seven years, but I grew up in California. Sure. So prior to Texas, where were you before that? Uh, California for three years when I met her. And then before that, I was in Las Cruces. But okay. Then, so you, well, yeah. I was bouncing back and forth between Texas and California. He's prior military, so. Now, military. I see. Our defense as well. Oh, very nice. Well, we're only guy. <laughs> what about you, Christine? Oh, I also grew up in the Bay Area. Um, yeah, I owned and operated my own windshield repair business for 12 years. Something like that. I don't know. Yeah, like about 12 years. I was contracting with almost every major lot in the Bay Area. So I was able to accumulate. I was, and I'm a really hard worker. I love working. I'm kind of like a working dog. If I'm not working hard, my brain goes mental and I just, I need something to focus on and do. So like out of middle business and being able to work hard, I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to put as much money your way as possible. And actually when I met him, he was the last date right. I was already gone because I was like done with dating. And I was like, I'm just going to save up money. I'm going to buy a farm in Fresno, which no one wants to live in Fresno, but the land is cheap. Everyone calls it Fresno. Um, and I was going to start in, a, in, in a, eh, animal rescue. But then you end up moving in, moving in Texas to seven. Man. You ruined everything, Matt. Guys tend to do that. I know. This is so much better than anything that could have happened in Fresno, though. You know, the heat is so much worse. Yeah, her first date, she asked me like a million questions to try to get rid of me. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I was like, are you dating to marry? Do you want kids? Like, just do you? Yeah, like, I was like, I'm not messing around here. Yeah? Yeah, because I was like, I'm dating to marry. The next person I date, I plan on marrying. So if you're going to date me, you need to know that. <laughs> He's like not even breaking a sweat. No. Like, yeah. His, his old yeah. was like, I was married before. It's fine. It's like, that's not the attitude you should have. <laughs> it was like practice marriage. Oh God. That's what his dad says. First thing his dad said to me was, hey, at least you're not the first wife. And I was like, oh, thank you. I think. Well, because my dad's yeah. married times my older brother he's married once before my uh other half brother has been married once before and so my dad's like it's always a practice marriage i guess then it's a compliment he must like you yeah 
I'm not, I was raised to like, you get married once. So that was sure. my thing. Yeah. The, 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 uh, family dynamics a little bit different on that side, huh? Oh yeah. Cause I mean, my parents have been married for almost 50 years at this point. Like, wow. lo- like there are days they love each other and there are days they hate each other, but they're like, we're married. <laughs> sure. Right. What part of Texas are you guys in now? Uh, we're just about 35 minutes north of Colleen, if you know where that's at. Central Texas. I think I've heard of it. You are Fort Otis? Mm, no. So Fort Otis is like very centralized, dead center of Texas. Um, we're just on the back side of Fort Hood. We have a very small town. Literally, the population is like 350 people. Oh, yeah. It's perfect. Yeah, we get a whole bunch of interesting noises from the base. Every once in a while, we'll get a sonic boom or a huge explosion. I just look at Clint and I'm like, what is that? And he's like, I don't know. They're just doing stuff on the base. We used to do stuff on the base. Fort uh, Cavazos? Cavazos. 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 Oh, oh, yeah. That's it's, what it is. And change the name because they okay. like, want to have the, this military base named after a slave owner, a racist. Which I get. But, you know, once it's been named something forever, people are going to call it that forever. Okay. I see, yeah, I see you guys aren't that far outside of Waco. Kind of like in between Waco and Austin. All right. Yeah, yeah we're at an hour to Waco and then an hour and a half to Austin. Nice. Cool. Yeah, I... uh I had interviewed Amber Oaks Ranch. He's also outside of Austin, but I can't remember which direction yeah. he he's at. But um, but I, I like I like so like Amber Oaks, like the A and the O, kind of like anarchy, yeah. right? Um, I really like your guys's name too. So like the the F A F O, obviously people yeah. can figure out what that means. Uh, so how did you decide on naming your farm like F A F O? So. I always tell people, like, especially during like the whole COVID thing and people just getting really ridiculous, like FAFO just started coming out of my own personality and like, I'm just embracing the suck because I, I even ran for city council in Austin too, um, before we moved. And I, I knew I wanted to have some humor in our farm. Um, and I knew being in Texas, it would definitely blow up, um, having FAFO as our farm name. Um, now since our in-laws kind of worked out with us to buy this land, because originally what we were going to do is sell our house in Austin and do everything ourselves, uh, get a loan, but interest rates were just way too high. And so what we ended up doing is we sold our house basically Bought the house for 260, sold it for 460, um, and used the profits to pay off some debt. And then a lot of the farm stuff on the property. And then our in laws, they sold their rental property in California, did a 1031 exchange. So they bought the property out here, cash in hand. And basically, instead of us paying back the bank, we're paying them. I see. Um, so it worked out in favor for all of us. That way they still have uh, retirement income coming in. They didn't have to get a loan to buy this property. We didn't have to get a loan to buy this property. Yeah. And they're also planning on moving up here soon. They're working on that. My mom grew up on a, not, she didn't grow up on a farm, but my family comes from farming. And so we, as young people, are loaned out to our farming family to help during the spring and fall. And so that's how she grew up too. And she loves it out here. She's just, anytime she's out here, she's just like, Ooh. I can't believe this line. She's so cute. She gets so excited. Like, it's so cool to see someone just like they're like when your face lights up and they're truly excited about something. Like, they see the possibilities. Right. Yeah. That is. That is always kind of like interesting bringing somebody like into your space because like it's your space, right? You yeah. like it. It's what you make it and you're like, are they going to like it? Are they not going to like it? Are they going to like crap on it? And then I kind of like want you to leave the second you get here. So, um, that's good that, that she, uh, that she enjoys being out there and oh yeah, has like a, go ahead. Her, her family is only one generation separated from the farm basically because her mom's parents were on the farm, right? Yeah. My grandma grew up in South Dakota. And so. Christine's mom and her were the first generations away from the farm full time. Christine's going back. Now, my my family, it goes back a couple of generations, back all the way to World War One. 
is when we were on far dirty farm life and homesteading life. But we we weren't like ranchers; we were pelters. Pelters? Yeah. So we were pelters going out and getting pelts. Oh, Here. right, right, right. Okay. Yep. Yep. I see. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of like my uh, paternal grandfather. Like they were like French Canadian like fur traders or something like that. Yeah. That that kind of thing. So. Yeah, that is kind of weird how, like, are, like, because I'm in the same boat, right? Like, I think you guys are somewhere, like, in your 30s, probably. It's like, yeah. my grandparents also, both, like, both pairs, like, were on the farm. And then my parents, like, could not leave the farm fast enough. And now I'm like, hey, let's do, you like, a farm. Like, we're, we're, like, more, like, homesteading lightly. Yeah. Uh, not, like, full-on farming. But uh, I'm the only one of, like, my siblings that does any of this stuff so gotta like get back into uh gotta make make my ancestors happy or something exactly i mean that's basically where we started two years ago like when covid hit and all lockdowns hit like we were kind of all isolated and we were big outdoorsy people going hiking all the time we're um working out all the time do all that fun stuff and i mean covid kind of kind of Caused us to shift and do a little bit things differently. So we are building like 33 raised carbon beds in our backyard. We were on a third of an acre. Um, so we're just doing a variety of different growing, different crops. Mm -hmm. And then we had a, she's like, well, let's get chickens. So we looked into our HOA. Can we get chickens? No. And it's, no, you can't get chickens. We did anyway. But the, the city of Austin says, as long as your chicken coop is 25 feet from the fence, Loopholes uh, are important. Yeah, but... as long as 25 feet from the fence, you can have chickens. No roosters, though. Yeah. I was like, okay, well, we're great friends with our neighbor on the left, who they, they're the only fence line there. And then we got three neighbors on the other side, but we put the coop right next to the fence line where the, we're good friends with them. We just give them eggs every week. We'll make them happy. The other neighbors can't complain. Uh, and so, end up getting the seven chickens and yep, seven uh, buff orpingtons uh, so we started producing the eggs and we give them eggs um a couple times a month uh but then the other neighbor no the neighbors never even heard the chickens um and it wasn't until we were selling our house that the neighbor next to us they're the ones in the buying it and when they did the tour they're like oh my god they have chickens yeah they're like we had no idea you had chickens they're like we're gonna be giving eggs this whole time if we're now and i was like yeah but whole point is so you don't know right that's funny yeah. do they keep do they keep up yeah. with the chickens they they got their own chickens which i'm super excited about yeah we left that because I, I we got a free coop on craigslist and then we threw some skis underneath it so we can move it around a little easier yep. awesome and then i built a makeshift mega cage around the coop so there's in the back corner of our property and they can leave their coop and hang around during the day. Uh, that way, if I couldn't get out of there, open the door, close the door, at least they're secure. We'd have to worry about, because there's a lot of hawks in our area. Sure. You know, a lot of missing cats. <laughs> uh, we didn't want to lose any chickens. Yeah. No bad with those cats, but don't take my chickens. <laughs> I just have one question. How do you find skis in Texas? Craigslist. <laughs> <laughs> there's always those like hey swing by there's a whole bunch of free stuff in front of my house and i'll be like okay i see like i see wood i can use i see some like fencing i could use so i'll go and you know grab what i need every once in a while there's something you're like oh ski because we used to be really good at this show called uh homestead rescue i like that show I it's ridiculous but i like it it's ridiculous it is ridiculous and i'm sure like 90 percent of it's fake but it gives you such good ideas about what you can do on your property for like really cheap and how to like resource them yeah too and so that's how we got started too is watching that show because we were walking our house and we're like what can we do to do outside things in our backyard and not be stuck in the hats yeah my job was drastically scaled back so i was working in the solar industry doing solar sales and nobody wanted you in their home and at that point, nobody was buying solar until like the summer hit when everybody was in their home for six months and their electric bills went through the roof. Oh. Second, you have to turn that AC on in Texas. Yeah. So, I mean, at, at the that first year with COVID, summer was really beneficial to us because they sold a lot of deals. I mean, like 30. Grand. And you never had to leave the house. I never had to leave the house. I had like 30 grand in like two months and really helped out because I didn't work for like another year after that. 
So are you living off the uh, savings? Nice. So are you both doing uh, the farm full time then? Yeah. Yes. We all did move financial mistakes that kind of uh, he fucked us a little. He kept us a little bit. So I'm going to be picking up some part time work. Um, working like 10 hours a week to actually sell in solar again online. Um, cause the goal is not to leave the fire for work. Uh, that, now it's going to be doing solar sales or data entry work, whatever it is to kind of recoup the money that we lost as we kind of forecasted it. The profits that we made from selling our house will allow me not to work for two years. Um, that way we can get our business off, off the ground and then hopefully within year and a half we have enough customer base to sustain ourselves best laid plans <laughs> so get, getting into that a little bit more so it seems like you guys bought the prop well you know through yeah, a series of handshakes did. right <laughs> you guys got the property and you got like right to work like this is going to be a fun like functional farm this is going to make us money how did you decide to like make that happen so we knew wherever it was going to be this property or another property, it was, we we're going to make it into a functional farm because we wanted to go back to that holistic lifestyle and create healthier food. Just because we're noticing more and more of the food that you're buying in the stores, you could not even pronounce the ingredients that were, that were making it. And we really saw a drastic in our health when we both jumped onto the carnivore diet. And so we buy it directly from a rancher. So there are no hormones, vaccines, stuff like that. So it's hundred percent healthy animal from start to finish. And so we're like, well, this is what we want to do. We want to provide a healthy option for people to eat. And so we decided that we wanted to do regenerative farming because we were, uh, she, she was listening to Jewel Salatin a lot. Um, and so we are looking at pastured poultry So he's like, well, you can either lease lease land, or if you have land, you can do this on an acre or two acres. And so we're like, okay, well, we plan on getting at least 20 acres. And I know more than 10 acres because as a disabled veteran of Texas, as soon as I own the land, uh, or if I give all the title, I don't have to pay property taxes anymore. As a 100% disabled veteran. Yeah, in Texas. In Texas. Yeah, uh, it's not state, but in Texas, which is one of the reasons we chose Texas, was because he has that, um, I don't know what you call it, advantage? Yeah, an advantage because I serve our country. Yeah. Uh, and so we would truly... That's a great advantage. Yeah. yeah. And so we would truly own our land so the government can never take it because we didn't pay property tax. That's one that I hate is like, nobody truly owns their own. Try not paying your property tax to you your see what the government does. Yeah. Um, so we just wanted to provide an helping option for people to um, buy from. And then we I started learning more about raw milk. So we're like, well, let's get a cow. And so we got a cow <laughs> and so we're, we're, uh, working on producing raw milk and we're like, well, let's try making cheese. So we started making cheese. And so originally it was just going to be pastured poultry. And then we've kind of branched off out of these other things, uh, and doing, and it's kind of growing the amount of products that we could offer to people, which will drastically increase our revenue base as well. Mm-hmm. So like doing, doing a head count of your livestock. So do you have egg layers and meat birds as well? Like you have both? Yes. So right now we have, uh, 40, we, we have 140 broilers. Yeah. We have 140 broilers. Probably you know, have 70 broilers that are going to be up for slaughter on September 9th. So yeah. that'll be our first slaughter. It's not the very first one we've done. We've done it in the past. We've done it in the past. And then we've also slaughtered birds that have died. Um, and we fed it to the dogs, of course, because we're... No, that is... There's not human meat. There's going to be your dog food. <laughs> or not. Yeah, so not, nothing goes to waste on this property. Um, everything has a, has a purpose. Uh, so we got our 140 birds. We have 25 um, Rhode Island Ray yes. for our layers. Um, and then we have just a mixed variety of birds in our master coop. Uh, but we plan on getting more Rhode Island Reds as soon as those 25 are fully grown and producing. That way we could get a base line of clientele that are buying eggs. So there's nothing worse than having more birds produce wings than you can sell. So we had a buddy that had like 200 chickens and they were all Three doctors. Dogs. 
He had three clients and he always had excess amount of egg. He's like, please take the please. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to take free eggs. I'll buy them. Yeah. And like, he's like, no, just take them. I was like, but we want to support you. I we're trying to support you, but I also don't so, want, I don't need this many eggs. Yeah. Your your buy one get three free sale is uh, not not that yeah. Great. And oh my god, we tried to send so many people his way too, and I was just like, oh, I was like, friend, you, you just went too hard, too quick. Oh yeah, and we ended up having end that relationship with him because we found out that he was because uh, he would get produce that went bad at the stores to give to his chickens. And so I found that he was selling that produce to people. So he was, yeah. he was getting produce that was thrown away at grocery stores, oh, was selling it to people that saying that he grew it. That's sketchy. Yeah. That's but super yeah. sketchy. Yeah, we reported it because that's not okay. Yeah. That's a health. That's it's super uh, like dangerous. You need to get sick. Not the first time that's happened in Austin, too. There's like a lot of scam. Health, yeah, because it's, it's everyone's in the health in Austin. It's supposed to There's a guy in Austin that was buying milk from the grocery store that's just regular milk, and he was selling this. Product. Yeah, he was going to like farmers markets, putting it in like glass vase and jars, like like this, and then saying it was raw milk. And I'm like, you can't do that to people. Like, you have to have integrity, or else this all goes to poop. So yeah, get but times are hard financially, but don't skip. Yeah, don't skip, skip people. Skip people. Wow. All that stuff like goes around, comes around. It's just yeah. a matter of it's just a matter of time. But sometimes people don't get their uh, the justice that they're owed, or or, do, or uh, whatever, yeah. right? Yeah. Do yep, yeah. Um. So then, so then your cattle. So you're you bought you bought one. You got one heifer. So oh, this is a fun story. So this this where we made our first mistake. We okay. We rushed into it because she's like. Let's get Dexter cows because they're tiny. And we want A2A2. We have to have A2A2. So we drive almost all the way up to Oklahoma. So it's about a six hour drive to the north part of Texas. We didn't go into Oklahoma. Uh, get up there and it starts downpouring. The and monsoon came through. The monsoon came through. And we get there and the couple's like, Oh, you brought the trailer. We thought you were just going to look at the cows. Like, oh, no, we want to buy them. So we didn't even look into like the demeanor of the cow or learn about the cow, the history of the cow. We're just, we're just going to buy it. We're just, we drove this far. We're going to pick them up. Never do that. Always drive, look at the cow first. Get to know the owners, get to know the cow's history, get to know the cow and the person. Yeah, they. Is she easy to work with? Like, does she come? Does she run away from the owners who she sees every day? Like, mm. And so we got a trailer and it took us a while to load up mom. She was, she was the easiest. Probably took us about 15, 20 minutes to load her up. Yeah. But the baby was difficult. The calf. And so yeah, her calf, we're for maybe 45 minutes to an hour. We were chasing him around and he was jumping through barbed wire, got scratched on his face. And we finally got him after I tackled him. And got him, dragged him into the trailer, and then starts downpouring again. And the trailer gets, the truck gets stuck in the mud. Oh, no. Oh, it's just sign after sign, like, do not take this cow with you. Yeah, I got God, the universe, whatever. Yeah. It was like, do not take these cows. I've given you every sign in the world. And so the do day- not take them home. We literally had to call the neighbor, their neighbor, to come and tow us out of the mud. And then tow us up the hill so we can get out of the neighbor mud. Yeah, and so that happened, and we had the cows for about a month, and we ended up bringing them to the auction house because it was just more trouble than dealing with. And that was a two thousand dollar mistake because it cost us twenty five hundred dollars to get them plus gas going up there and back. So we lost about two thousand dollars after we sold them at the auction. So always do, your, yeah, and yeah, so always do your due diligence to learn about the cow, uh, what their demeanor should be. And then go visit that cow. Uh, don't bring your trailer. Don't you may want to take them home. Yeah, you may want to take them home and bring your trailer. So that was sign one of God telling us not to do something. Uh, what was the second sign? Not the seat drill. But this was the second sign? I think so. Uh, but then, then we ended up getting So the next cows were the jerseys. Oh, we sat so, on jersey. Well, well we had to. You know, we had to. Unfortunately, the calf, her calf died of overeating disease. Uh, mm-hmm. 
spores on the ground, apparently. Yeah, so we learned the doctor when there's severe droughts or severe flooding. Which we're in a, an exceptional drought right now. That the, the spores um, that cause overeating disease um, will attack calves, lambs, and uh, horses, the, the, young, the young ones. And so it just it rots their gut and causes them to overeat. And then um, the dog, I mean, yeah. her gut was. Because he did a, a, a necropsy on her because we wanted to know at least mm -hmm. what happened. So if there was something we could have prevented, we would be more aware. The next time or... yeah, he's like, there's nothing that you could have done. I mean, he's like, once they, once they get infected, they die 24 to 48 hours. And there's no something. There's yeah. a, she was doing cows and knees all around because we do intensive uh, rotational grazing. Yeah, we move so I just them every day. And whenever we move her, she always says zoo beats around her new pen. And she was doing her little cows and always being super cute. And the next morning we came out and she was just gone. She was just stiff as a rock. Wow. Yeah. What a gut punch. Like it was, it was, it was definitely the most terrible moment on this farm so far. And he stabbed himself. So oh, yeah. Almost second to what said was we were looking at getting a seed drill for the property so we could plant uh, cover crops for the, uh, the fall. Uh, and so we drive three and a half hours to this one location and like I looked at the seed drill online and then going there in person, it was a lot bigger than what I thought it was. And I was like, well, I don't think our tractor is going to be able to haul this. Let alone, like, how the hell are we going to get this off the flatbed? Uh, and so my gut was just not, I was not listening to my gut. And so we kept on loading it, loading it, and take it apart. And he's like, hey, here's a knife. Cut the zip tie over here so I can undo this hose. And so it looked like a dull butter knife. And so it was not, it was not, it was super, super sharp. And it cut through that zip tie like butter. Uh, and then it cut into my hand as well. Oh, yeah. So I was not expecting that. They can go to the hospital. No, so then we went to three different emergency rooms that would not take uh, the VA care. So under Donald Trump, that. Yeah, under Donald Trump, I was able to go to any hospital and get care. But under a, a Biden, they reneged all those contracts and they drastically reduced them. So now I, there's only certain hospitals I can go to. Yeah, because we had to go to the literal BA in Victoria, I think it was. Yeah, in Victoria. We had to go to the literal BA and be like, hey, can you tell us what hospital? As Click sitting there with, like, with blood ever, all over his shirt and stuff. And I see patients there. I'm like, can you guys stitch this up for me? Because if, if you guys are going to stitch this up, I'm just going to go to Walgreens to go get super glue. Yeah. But it, it didn't It didn't hurt. It, was, it wasn't in pain. It was burning. and Bleeding. Well, it wasn't really bleeding. Uh, it was... One of those empty cavities in the hand that doesn't use a lot of blood. Um, mm -hmm. Although it was just like an open wound, basically. Yeah. Yes. Burning and inconvenient. Uh, and I was just like, yeah, like, can you guys stitch this up? Because I mean, you guys are a hospital, right? They're like, yeah, but you're not a patient down here, so we can't see you. Yeah. I'm like, well, I'm oh, a I So you have to go to the Central Texas VA. That's two hours away. To no, like, four hours. No bonds. It was four hour drive to the VA center that I can go see Kara. I lay like, a veteran. A lot of percent disabled veteran. What do you mean you can't see? And they're like, well, you can go to the hospital down there. You're like, really, thank you. Good day. <laughs> like every step of that is wrong. Just like the first stop should have been the only stop. Like this is, that's. Well, I always tell people, I was like, if you want socialized healthcare, look at the Veterans Affairs. I was like, that's socialized healthcare. Yeah. They should get, like, the best uh, care, not the worst. Like, what is, I don't know. Yeah. It is what it is. Uh, that's why I don't go to the VA. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Lord. Um, I, I had, like, three three or four questions, and I forgot all of them. Uh <laughs> So, okay, so I, I I did write a couple of them down. Uh, so you had mentioned A2, A2. I have heard of A2, but can you explain for, for people, like, what, what is A2 when you're looking for a dairy cow? Okay, so a, A2, A2, there's protein in the milk. There's, as far as I understand, there's A1, A2, which is, there's two different proteins, and there's A2, A2, which is one protein. Apparently, it's easier for your gut to break down one protein 
It's so they're breaking down two. It's just simple. That's the dumb version my uh, cow mentor gave us, the lady we got our jersey from. Our jersey's actually not in 2A2. Um, she was artificially inseminated with a calf, and our calf actually was A2A2. Oh. One that died, unfortunately. Right. Um, yeah. So we still don't have an A2A2, but that's okay because our dairy cow right now is a dream. Like you have, we went from having Tr- Moody Trudy, which was our first dairy cow. Her name was Trudy. So I didn't make up Moody Trudy so much as in it was just fitting. Um, that's good. Doing anything with her was a struggle. Getting her to go anywhere, milking her was a struggle. Like she just did not like people. She did not like us. Mm. And that's okay. We weren't the best fit. Yeah, I mean, in our in our morning chores, the evening chores were taking like she had an hour, an hour under our chores was with just her, and so like our morning chores have dra- dropped down to forty five minutes to an hour, and our evening chores are down to forty five minutes. And so we yeah, have systems now. And That's good. We grow the farm. Those forty five minutes probably turn back into an hour and a half, two hours, but that will be because we're producing a lot more product. Gotcha. Um, so you just have the jersey. Are you looking to get another calf or another cow? Or we did get a rescue calf um, for her. Um, that way she wouldn't feed all emotional distress and stop producing milk. Yeah, she's also taken care of it, which is crazy. And she does take care of the calf, and they've kind of bonded. Um, they didn't bond for like the first day and a half, um, but then. We one day I saw her doing her, licking her and cleaning her. I was like, finally, okay, she's accepted her. Yeah, she, was, she pulls up on her. She pulls up her udder right next to her mouth. Well, the calf doesn't drink from her udder. Uh, we're still working on that. We're trying to get. Oh, her. okay. We should be working on that. We're not really. I try when I'm out there, <laughs> but it's kind of hard to do it by yourself, and it's kind of hard to get you to do it with your hand. Yeah. Now I've got a lot of labor stuff I haven't been able to do with my hand. Normally I milk the goat. Uh, now she's doing that. Luckily, we built everything on the farm, so only one person, if it comes to that, if one of us gets hurt for some reason, because we do have a lot of accidents. There's a reason it's called FAPO. Um, <laughs> not 100%. If every one of my family had bets on me going to the hospital first because of a farm incident, and everyone lost because he went. I didn't want to hurry up in the ER because she's, she's more accident prone than I am. She's been in the ER multiple, multiple times. Uh, since we've been dating, I've only been to the ER once. That's because I took a picket pounder to the head. Um, and, yeah. And it's when we were doing the fencing in our backyard. So I was just like, picket, picket, picket. And then it went too high and I missed the picket and it went straight down onto my head. Oh, oh my God. Yeah, it wasn't a good day. I still have a scar. And, and your mom. And so it's a double whammy. Yeah, and, 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 and I'm bald, so it's a double whammy. And it's still, still healing. Or no, that's not. I scraped my head on the chicken coop. No, from. Uh, we were trying to get Axe's tail here. Yeah, we were trying to get Axe's tail hair as I was holding on to it, pulling his tail hairs out, and he bumped me up and hit the, hit the top of the shed, and scraped my head open. But that wasn't an ER visit. It was just a superficial wound. Yeah, we just put that to duct tape on that <laughs> you guys need a solid med kit at, at home oh, we do. That we're not... we everywhere we have we a giant solid med kit but i mean duct tape and glue, uh, glue fixes a lot. sounds like christine has the quantity aspect of going to the er but clint here has the uh quality just like if you're gonna go you gotta go big like yeah. tear your right. hand wide open head wide open oh yeah well, she took a table saw to her finger. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I got super into building my own wood for a quick minute. And well, I was showing her how to use a table saw. And she's like, I got this. I'm like, are you sure? I was in the house for like 10 minutes and I just hear screaming. Yeah. Did I have a finger, but it's all messed up. We call it my, my witch's finger. Can I see but, it? Well, I don't know if you can really see it, but you can a little see, bit. Like, how it's like supposed to be edited. And then like the palm of it is kind of messed up because it literally sliced it in half like it was like two two different like so it's split this way right right in between (laughs) i bet she stepped on uh it's a i think it's called a kanaho it's a japanese gardening hoe it's It's like a lord and yeah super sharp like literally you could take paper next to it pat the paper 
And she was in the garden working on the garden. And Barefoot because I'm grounding. And she set it upside down and it was like 50 miles an hour uh, wind going on. And she got blown over, stepped mm-hmm. on it, and sliced her three times. What is it with the camera? It's not. I don't know, babe. It like, it like didn't, they like it got real focused. Yeah. Really that's a, that, that's all right. Uh, all right, your <laughs> so, so the FAFO, uh, have you, has, has that like, you, you said like your, your area, like in Texas, like that people kind of like that. So has they that been like a, it. you know, well, uh, it's, it's okay. So that's been good for marketing for you guys. Oh, yeah. Like I, I was, when we first aimed at that, I'm like, are people going to think we are not serious about the food and like, we're not like, we're just like not taking it seriously and we're like. The food is not good or whatever, but like they love it. Like we went to our first market like two weeks ago. I don't know, it was like a week ago. Was just last week, probably by Saturday. Tractor Supply. Yeah, like two weeks ago. And Tractor Supply had a farmers market. Cool. And if anybody that has a local farm can sign up for the uh, farmers market. Oh, let's go sign up. Yeah, I know it's great. And so I reached out to my market. Um, we got to do all my marketing stuff for my campaign for city council. Say, hey, can you like do a rush order on a tablecloth? Because uh, we weren't expected to do a farmer's market so quick. And I brushed one through, got the Fafo Farms with a cannon, shooting the, tur- the chicken, and come and taste it. And then we, uh, we set up, and a lot of people, they saw it, and they just started laughing. They're like, and they beelined from their car. And they're like, what is this about? Yeah, like, Tell me more. Like, uh, what do you sell? I was like, well, we're selling soap right now. Like, soap? I was like, yeah, we're, we're, we, our main business is pasture poultry, but we just, our birds aren't ready for processing yet. Um, that will be on September 9th. You can do a pre order if you want to buy any a week prior. So we already got three people that are interested in buying our pasture poultry. And then, so we were giving out free raw milk tastings. Because a lot of people don't know anything about raw milk. They've never even tried it. So, we had so that milk. was really fun. Yes, yeah, so we had milk from the cow and the goat there for people to try. And then we were giving out free cheese. So we're like, anybody that buys a bar of soap or wants to become a customer gets a free roll of cheese. And so we had Italian herb, jalapeno, or smoked jalapeno, and plain. And then we also had samples of each one for people to try, and people love the cheats. And so, like, someone's like, "Oh, let me go get my my wife; she'll love this." And came back like an hour later with his wife, and she's like, "Yeah, I'll 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 be a customer. I'll buy some soap, and I'll get that." One guy bought like six bars of soap, and so if he's been back, I don't know what he's doing with the soap. I don't care. And then he, but he keeps coming back for more. He came back to our he came back to our house two days ago to buy some more soap and get some more. Uh, well, he bought the soap for his friend. Then he bought, uh, he donated uh, some money, as, uh, and then we gave him some raw milk because his friend wanted to buy some raw milk, so we brought him a gallon of raw milk. Nice. Yeah. What's What are the raw milk laws down in Texas? Is it just no issues? or So it needed to be a grade A dairy, um, and so their information is super outdated. It really needs to be revitalized. The law needs to be changed because literally they'll say the the structure that's required to be compliant for a grade A dairy, just for the electrical portion, it doesn't even go over the electric portion. It says you need to have 10 long candles of lighting to be compliant. What the hell does that even mean now that when we have electricity? Also, I'm pretty sure if you they, like the inspector showed up and you just had 10 long candles, they would immediately fail your inspection. So, like, that's a fire acid. <laughs> sure. Yeah. That is so, you should just do it just to like comply, right? Just like, you're my 10 long candles. I kind of want to a little. Well, I mean, what we should do is build it to proper code to nowadays, but just like hide the lighting, like have it just covered up and then just have 10 small candles facility. Do a big Grimio, we'll pull off a sheet off our big light or something later. Yeah. Get light fixtures that just look like candles. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Love that. You said 10 long cables, right? It's just right here in the bit for 10 long cables. Yeah. And uh, when we, were, we brought that to the USDA here locally, and they're, they're like, they were laughing. They were laughing. They're, they're like, what? I, 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 love, I brought out the sheet. I was like, can you explain to me what this means? Because we want to build code. We want to be legal. We want to, 
be able to provide our community with awesome, amazing, raw, great dairy. Well, there's no micro dairies around here. So none of the people around here knew anything about it on how to be compliant for a dairy farm. Yeah. And so many people at the market were like, oh my God, I love this. This is amazing. Like a lot of the older women were like, I had a cow when I was a kid. Our family had a cow and I haven't had raw milk since I was like 13. And I was like, I'm glad I can provide that for you, but like, I'm sad that you don't have that anymore. And like the family cow has just gone away. So in your area, are you like, nope, nobody else is doing raw milk in your area? Closest one is about 45 minutes to an hour away. Wow. That's a good little corner that you've got where you're at. Only one other person doing pastured poultry out here. And he doesn't like doing it. Well, no, the guy that owns the uh, the barbecue place that we eat, and then, then that one meat shop that we went to. Yeah. The guy that owns the meat shop. Oh, okay, I'll send you out the other guy. Yeah, we, we met someone actually right before we bought this property who actually lives in this town. He does pastor poultry as well. But he actually focused on uh, the Hibitus family. They also have a family farm. They focus on, like, spices and stuff like that, like grooming okay. pepper, and, like, they make their own vanilla extract and stuff like that. He's not a huge, he's like, I'm actually trying to get away from the pastel poultry. I'm not a huge fan. Oh, I don't know. He didn't really go into it, but we love doing it. So good. You're, uh, so are you in your pastor poultry model? Are you moving like a chicken tractor every day or are you doing like premier one netting? So we don't do the premier, uh, netting around the chicken tractors just because they're so secured. And then we have uh, a mammoth donkey that kind of hangs around them because they, they spread all their feet all, all yeah, around Yeah, it goes everywhere. She loves eating. And she loves eating feet. So she hangs around the chicken tractors at night. So she's basically the protector. Um, now the chicken shell that we have for our eggers, that does have a premier fencing around it. To keep them safe. Uh, to keep them safe. Even though they don't like to stay in it, they like to squeeze through the hole. They're still really young. They're probably like nine weeks. Yeah, they still got about four weeks before they can no longer fit through the, the net. But they, they do wander around the property during the day, and then they'll go to a secure spot during the night. Um, if it's, yeah, if it's in one of the, cause we got three different areas. We always have one area that's pre kind of pre-set up. So when we do move the ne- the following day or, or right now we're moving them every two days from each netting, the chicken tractor gets moved twice a day just because they literally mow the grass down to the, to the dirt. So they have to get moved twice a day or they're basically living on top of their filth. Uh, for 24 hours, that's the last thing we want them to be doing. Yeah, the whole point of doing pastor poultry is to do a better poultry where they're not breathing in their fe- fecal matter all day. They're not. Uh, but yeah. as soon as we get the cover crops going and the thicker vegetation, because there's not a lot of vegetation on the property, um, once we get all that done, we won't have to move the chicken tractor twice a day. We do move it once a day. Nice. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then go ahead. I was just saying right now, like the number one thing we're focusing on is uh, regenerating our soil because it was completely destroyed. Oh, we can't do that with telebrains. Yeah. Well, we're, we're regenerating it right now by having them on the thing, we're moving them every day, and they poop everywhere. Well, we can regenerate the soil until we plant seed. You can't plant the seed until it rains. Of course. Just because that poop on it doesn't generate. Oh, yeah, I know, but we're putting inputs to it right now, in a natural way. You're just getting in the. In the motion, right? You're just right. practicing. Creating habits. Good habits. There you go. Yep. Routine, procedures, protocols. Yeah. So your your goats, how many goats do you have? Three, uh, two female Nubians and one male Nubian. Yeah, one's in milk. The other is a little bit younger. We're going to breed her next year. And then we have uh, Billy. And so you're just keeping the billy for breeding purposes or? Yeah, we're going to use him for breeding purposes. And then once we're done with him, and then he's going to become meat. So he'll be a dual purpose goat. Yeah, that's why we want the newbie because they're dual purpose. They're good for milk and meat. Uh, and then we'll get another male. Um, probably get a better stock of line. Uh, I like because I like him just because of his color scheme layout. Um, but we're not doing show goats, so. Right. 
focus better on meat quality and milk quality. Um, <clears throat> that'll be our next line. Uh, I know Nubians are big out here. Um, one of the local uh, hardware stores, there's a young gentleman that I talk to all the time. I'm buying stuff for the projects we're working on the farm. His family specializes in Nubian goats. Um, they they have anywhere between 800 and 1,200 head of yeah. Nubian goats. Holy smokes. Yeah. yeah. They, 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 heck of a lot of goats. So yeah. They're on, they're on 1,100 acres, so they got a lot of land. Uh, but he says the, the reason why they have so many goats is because in Texas, the, uh, the worms are a big issue for goats. Yeah. He says they lose about 30 to 40 goats a month just to warm it. Uh, but wow. And that, and that's another reason why we're doing regenerative farming. And also the rotation of the reason. And the rotation of grazing is because you'll have the cattle, and then you'll have the chickens, and you'll have the goats, and then you'll have the chickens again. And that that eradicates diseases on the land. So you're not going to have to worry about getting your, your animals dewormed. You're not going to have to worry about getting your animals vaccinated and all this stuff. Yeah, they clean up after each other and having them move every day to a different spot and letting the land rest. And having that natural cleaning system come through with the sunlight and the UV rays, I mean, for us, it's, it seems like the best way to go. Because we actually haven't had any worming problems. No. Like, I was super scared about worming problems because everyone screams about worms and goats and stuff like that. And I've been freaking out. But, like, we have had their soul tested a couple of times and nothing. And I'm just like, thank God. I'm sure one day we'll have a problem with it, but hope <laughs> not. I pray not, but, you know. It is farming, so. Yeah. Has your uh, your goats been contained pretty well, or have they all escaped at some point? Oh, they, they, there's, I think it was like two days ago. They're on timeout for a week because yeah. uh, May, the oldest one, didn't drink. Yeah, she's the alpha. Uh, oh. She clears the premier fencing in one hop. And, and she knows she can do it. And she knows she can do it. And so... We got to put them on timeout for a week before they get put back off. And then they're good for about two, three weeks. And then she gets a little uppity, uppity, she jumps over. And as soon as she jumps over, the other two want to escape too. Yeah. They they have, it's funny to watch this, but they literally have separation anxiety. Kind of kind. Yeah. So like May is super attached to us. So if we're with her a lot, she wants to be with us. And there was one week where she kept ending up at our front door. And I was like, why are you here? I love you, but don't be here. And so we've actually had to take a step back from the goats a little bit. Because we used to spend like a lot of time with them. Like we'd hang out in our pen and all that stuff. But we found that the more we did that, the more May would pop the fence and come want to be with us. And we also have four dogs, which are not farm dogs. Well, three of them are farm dogs. But we don't want any accidents to happen because of our, I don't know how to put it, our caring and not caring. Right. Yeah. I, I, not me so much. Yes. He was built. I, for I was built for rescue. <laughs> Not a good. I went. I went on like a binge of like watching like pack goats because I'm thinking about getting like pack goats and yeah. maybe sell it as like a service for like hunting or backcountry camping or whatever. And this guy that does pack goats out in Idaho, he's like, my like I have dogs and I love dogs, but goats make better dogs than dogs do, and just oh, like yeah. they have like this. They're, they're like a great, uh, they're just a great animal for kids to grow up around and oh, yeah. they're super resilient. Treat them like a dog. Yeah. 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 Mando the male, he was bottle fed. So on the so cuddly. He just wants to cuddle with you. Yeah. You know? and like if you, if you sit, like we used to have a chair in their pen because I would sit in there and read and hang out with them. And if you sat down, he immediately would try to crawl up into your lap. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, it's like, bro, you're too big. Get up. I'm like, you're out later, like a 120 pound go. You can't be doing this, bro. <laughs> How often do you have to trim their hooves? Uh, we actually haven't trimmed them since we've gotten them. Yeah. Uh, they actually break their the tips of their hooves off constantly because they're always trying to re reach over the gate. So they always, always break them. So we haven't actually had to trim them. Yeah, we're having your fairy come out on Sunday, though, to take care of our donkey. So he's going to look at the rest of our animals while he's out here this time. Because last time when he was out here, he checked them. He's like, they're all good. But that was about a month and a half ago. A month and a half ago, yeah. 
No, when we got the mammoth donkey, her hooves were severely overgrown. And so we're like, oh, we need to get a farrier hire ASAP. Yeah, because when we got our mammoth donkey, we got our mammoth donkey from a guy who rescues donkeys. But he used to rescue donkeys when he was younger. And now he's like in his 70s or 80s. And he's like, I can't take care of all these donkeys anymore. So I need someone else to take to rescue them. So that's how we got her. And so like... She, yeah. was, she was definitely worth the drive. Yeah, we drove all the way to Oklahoma for her, and she is the sweetest. Like, the second she sees you in the morning, she comes running over. She very, she nestles her head in your chest, or she'll go behind your back and, like, nestle you back. But I've also seen her stomp out a squirrel to death that tried to save her. <laughs> so, I don't know why that's funny. And it's hilarious. I'm just like, she has such a personality. She's like, I love you, but don't mess with me. So it's like, I'm 100% like a 900-pound animal. I may be sweet, but recognize that. Well, if you guys... He set aside, we're going to get a jack for her, another mammoth donkey, because there is no other mammoth donkeys in Central Texas. Hmm. Uh, we'll end up starting to breed her so we could start selling mammoth donkeys. And the is that, what is, okay, <laughs> what is it about a mammoth donkey that's desirable? So, first off, every mammoth donkey in the United States is a descendant from George Washington's donkey. Hmm. Um, secondly is their size. Um, they're massive. They're, they're massive. They're more closer to a horse and they're a lot bigger than most horses. Well, not most horses, but she's about 12 hands. So she's a big girl. girl. So she's a big, big girl. Uh, for a donkey. And a lot for a bear. She's just super sweet. Yeah. I think, I think I heard, um, Donkeys could be like smarter than horses too. Like they're oh, she like brilliant. she she she's figured out. We had to switch a couple of the locks on our fences because she figured out how to open up the chain and get out, and then go to where the feed is. Like she's super smart. There's been a couple of times we were in the middle of milking and puts like your friends here. And they're like what what? And the I look around behind me and there's Penny putting her big fat face in the feed, and I'm just like what are you doing? She's a that's funny. And then you can sell donkey milk or... Yeah. Yes, it's not a large volume. So think of it like goat's milk. Yeah, you get about two quarts max. Yeah, they don't have big buckets, so they don't produce... There's not a lot of a large volume. And so that's why people don't typically sell donkeys as a product to sell. Okay. Um, but mammoth donkey would be a great product for labor if once someone wants to use them for the land or companion animals. Yeah, because we also got got her just because she's sweet. <laughs> Terrible financial decision, but I don't know. So, are, uh, have you guys trained her at all, to, or, or planning on training her to like move anything if you needed to, like put a harness on her or something? We don't, because she's like thirteen years old, and I know they uh, they live up to be about fifty. Um. But we don't know her her background, and so we haven't taken her to the vet to see if we got a wellness check, but not like a full. You know, we haven't done to see like, can she sustain uh, putting a saddle on her and stuff like that? Because the last thing we want to do is having her start dragging stuff, and then she has got a bad back or something. Sure, looks yeah, good, Kenny. But yeah, the main thing is the milk. The milk actually, you a lot of people want donkey soap. It's kind of like goat's milk soap, but it's donkey soap. But it, apparently it just has a lot more vitamins and minerals and stuff in it for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> hmm. Uh, what, do you guys ever get your stuff like tested to see like what the like levels of this and that are in your cow uh, milk and your goat milk? And We're actually super excited. We're getting ready to send some stuff off to the lab. This Not this week, because obviously it's Friday. We'll probably, we'll probably end up sending milk into the lab probably towards the end of October once we... Oh, it's fun. I'm doing that week. <laughs> no, nah, we're going to do it towards the end of October once we've kind of finalized the plans for the milking structure. Uh, I, I don't like jumping ahead um, and getting things done that aren't a priority. So I want to get the structure done first, and then once we get the structure done, schedule the inspection, and then once we've scheduled the expansion, the inspection, then we'll send out the milk to get tested. Because it'll probably take about a month for the inspector to come out. So by then, we'll have the results from the milk done. And we can use that because I know they're typically sticklers. And they want something that's typically fresh that's been tested. 
So is that recent? Been, yeah, recent. Because I know they could say, well, we've been feeding the cow the same thing and that things change with that cow's health. So they want the most recent and most up-to-date testing. Yeah, I think you have to get the sample within like 12 to 24 hours before sending it in, which I'm like, that makes complete sense. Because why would you send in old milk? Right. Yeah. So would you say that the biggest challenge in just getting started, it has been the laws and like rules and regulations and all this, all this stuff like that's it it been. Is. And they make it very difficult. And it's like, you want to do the right thing. Really do. Like we have been trying to do the right thing every step of the way and we continue to do that. But like the, for the fast rate full training, I literally have been trying to call their office, just ask questions. And I drove down to Austin where their main office is located at, get down there, walk in, and nobody goes to the office anymore. They all work from home, but they don't answer their phones. So I'm like, well, can I go up to the office and grab the proper paperwork? No, you're not allowed to go up there because nobody's in the office. I'm like, okay. How do I get the paperwork if I can't download it off the website? Yeah, because the website just refreshes when yeah. you click the link. And we even went to the USDA up here. It was like, we will show you that it does that. And she's like, oh, it does. That, that sounds good. And I'm like, you're right. It's not. This is hindering people to want to bring other people great food for their community. <laughs> so, yeah, it's like, we're going to continue moving forward anyways. And then uh, we finally got email back. But I was like, if because we spoke with the USDA. They said, we'll email somebody. We'll take your email and they'll send you paperwork. I drove down, I, I drove down to Austin. So I was like, okay, well, I've done everything that I can do. Now, now the government has made it difficult because they decided our employees don't have to go into work. We're not going to have our website actually accessible to the public to get the proper paperwork. Then they can take me to court and try to sue me or penalize me because I'm selling chicken and I'm not licensed. Well, I'm not licensed because you make it impossible to get licensed because you hindered every possible step to get it done. Yeah. Plus our first batch, we're planning on getting a lot of it away free because- Yeah, we plan on going to the fire station, the sheriff's station, the local PD, that eight. Um, local, local, uh, local fire department. And then um, also Gatesville is like a prison town. They have got seven prisons out here. And so, what? yeah, I, we, we opened in Gatesville. We live in a town of 300 people right outside of Gatesville, but our big city was 16,000 16, people, which is the biggest employer is the, in the, prison. Is the prison system. And so I'm reaching out to like their union because I know they got a union out there and then see if I connect with them to donate chicken to them free just to get some clientele to try some samples. Stuff like that. Also just to beat people. I talk to that. I look at clientele. I know you, Gene. I mean, this is why we work because he's all business and I'm all like the theory of fart. I bring that to the business, but. Um, I'm careless. I know. But like, I remember the first time I tried Pastor Poultry. And I, it was like, I don't want to say it's life changing, but it's a little life changing. You're like, oh my God, this is what chicken tastes like when right. it's properly. Yeah, like, I had no idea. Like, we slaughtered our first. Pastor told you chicken. I was like, oh my God, the flavor is so much better. It's so different. It's, so it's like you've been living in the matrix and then you finally get to taste what real food's like. Exactly. And it's like, and I can't describe it to people. And ever since we had that pastor poultry, I've been obsessed with it. And that's when I started like looking up Joel Salatin and like Justin Rose and like how many guys do pastor poultry and all this other stuff. And I was just like, oh my gosh. It like having good food makes you excited about food. And like when people are like, because we are we were 100% carnivore at one point. They're like, how do you eat just meat all day? I'm like, you don't understand. When you get meat from a rancher, not from the factory feedlot, when you get it from a rancher who also does regenerative um, farming, we get ours from KNC cattle out here in Central Texas. Like, it's different. The, mm -hmm. the texture, the flavor, everything. Like, all we have to do is put salt and pepper on this meat, and it's amazing. It's mind-blowing. Like, it's really ruined other meat for us you don't have to season it to make it taste good. no it's right. good on its own and it's a completely different like vapor palette or i don't know how you describe say that but 
Yeah. It just has real flavor to it. Yeah. And it, it it's like going from eating like, I guess, like a plain tortilla chip to like, I well, that's a horrible example. I don't, I don't even know what to say. No, I get what you mean. I, yeah. I also made the same comparison. It's like, I, I don't think that's talked about enough that you have to do so much less to prepare your food when it's real food compared yeah. to like, grocery store whatever junk meat um you yeah you have to mask the flavor you have to like put all this effort into it just to make it like palatable and where you can just do like salt and pepper and you're like yeah this is this is great yeah like i i especially i tell people like tomatoes are pretty easy to grow and they're the like everyone eats puts tomatoes on things you put tomatoes in your your spaghetti vegetable dish uh a lot of people just like tomatoes and things like, just grow your own tomatoes for one season and try those and then try going back to the grocery store. Yeah. You're not going to be able to. It's a completely different vegetable. The ones you raise yourself and when you've done it right by it and you've grown it organically and used good compost and all other stuff, it's a completely different vegetable than what you pick up in the grocery store, even though it still says run the tomato. On the um, laws and regulations and, like, the selling uh pasture pasture poultry you guys have cottage food laws out there so like under a certain amount of birds you like don't yeah. need to bother usda and it's like ten thousand birds yeah we and just have was- yeah texas is good about that that's one good thing texas is good about is it was capped at a thousand till i think two years ago and then after covid they were like we just need to open this up to more birds as people need it i remember the chicken shortage we had where like I think it was like thighs or breasts that we were short on. And I was very confused because I'm like, are they growing chickens without thighs? Like, where are the thighs? But it's just, I think after that whole chicken thing, they they were like, okay, let's just let people grow their food. What's this bridge between 1,000 and 10,000 when we have factory farmers doing like millions of birds a year? Sure. And we know which one is clear. That's right. What would you guys say the best part about farming is? Uh, well, one being self sufficient and spending time more time together. More time together is my, but yeah, definitely being more self sufficient. Like, if poop completely hit the fan, we could survive pretty well out here. We are not off the grid, but you know, that's something we're working towards because eventually we want to be a completely self sustainable. But we could eat. We have a garden. We have our cows. We have our goats. We have our chickens. We need a star. And I go shoot it here. Yeah. Oh, another crazy thing is our um, area is so prol- proliferated with deer that if you own land out here, you can get up to 26 deer tags. For, for your property. Yeah. Because they want, they want you to be clear of the deer. Like, they're so many deer. smokes. I mean, they'll let the cook a pork last month. Uh, there's been about 20 or 30 dead deer on the side of the road. They're just, there's so many out there. Yeah. There's new roadkill every day. That's just feeding the coyotes. Holy smokes. Yeah. So they're like, I mean, they're like, please take the hunting tags. The animals out here are big. I mean, even the rabbits are out here are big. I mean, one day a rabbit oh, light across the uh, road and I was driving the Prius because I'm like, with gas prices, we use it to, we use the Prius everywhere. Big, big rabbit is beelines, and then I hit it dead center of the car, and it snaps the bumper and then bends the grill inside the Prius. That's how big that rabbit was. Like, we will not starve. We have turkeys everywhere, too, so. Yeah, like, literally, I I pull up my house, go a quarter mile, and there's, like, 14, 15 turkeys just going down the dirt road. I'm like, if I had my pistol and then I should pop one of you. Not legal. (laughs) If I had a bow, you could shoot at and you could shoot out your car window with a bow if there's a turkey on the side of the road. Nice. Just get one of those like toy uh crossbows or whatever that have like, the bolts on them or like this big. A real bitty Yeah, our parents have a mini crossbow place. Awesome. That's awesome. So to to wrap up a little bit here, what would you tell people that want to get started with uh just starting their own farm i mean they could you know jump right in like you guys or stick the like toe in the water what would you guys suggest 
Well, one thing I would suggest them is get started now. Don't wait. If you want to. Um, if you tr- this, is, this is something you truly want to do, do it now. The longer you wait, the harder it's going to be, especially as the, the dollar is getting deflated. So things are becoming more expensive than they were five years ago. So do it now while the dollar is still valued high. Um, and pick one thing that you want to start with. And so if you're going to be focusing on crops, like a garden that you want to focus on, I would look at what is a high cash value product for crops to sell. Right now, that is kale. So if someone wants to be producing produce, it's grow kale. You get, I think it's like a, for every three square meters, it's like $1,000. Um, they can get for kale. kale is very expensive right now. And it's all the people in California that are paying for their oh, you know, juices or Austin. Yeah, you can, you can get a lot of money for kale or kale farmer. Um, and we don't want to go that route because it's going to take a lot of water and a lot of patience and a lot of maintenance. Um, we're going down the pasture poultry route and then we just have other small farms. Yeah, I, I'd say start small and start where you can, like grow where you're planted. I have friends who started gardening on their apartment balconies. I have friends who kept two chickens in a giant fish tank in their apartment because they wanted to let that. And they got like really awesome. quiet chickens. Yeah, they got really quiet chickens. So they they wouldn't be discovered. They did get away with it. But it's like you can do so much wherever you are. You just don't realize it. And start small. Really try to find good, good mentors. We really lucked out on our second cow because the people we bought them from they're amazing. They, they're like, Hey, how are you guys doing? How's the cow doing? Is there anything we can help you with? Do you have any questions about feed or vet visits or they're, they're... they even offer to like hook us up with their uh, artificial insemination guy. They're like, I don't know if you want to bring her all the way up here again, but if you want to bring her up here, we can get her AI again. And you know, she can go back down and I'll milk her and her in for you. And I was like, no, it's okay. But they actually like really truly care about the people where their animals go. Yeah, awesome. they had somebody else looking at the cow, uh, the purchases as well. And we came the day after they did. And they're like, we like them better. They're like, you guys are super based and you're military. <laughs> I, I can trust you. I was like, we can't trust everybody in the military. He looked at me weird. I was like, yeah, you, get, you can't trust Dan Crenshaw. And he started laughing. He's like, no, I really like you. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. But you just have to be real authentic with people. And I think if you are, it'll shine through and they're going to want to help you. I mean, get, get tied into yeah. your community. That's the dollar one thing. Yeah. Never wise. You can, you can have the best product and you can have the best whatever. But if you're not tied into your community, people are going to buy from you. Yeah. Cause we're direct to market. So we're really trying to sell directly to our community. We're not trying to sell like online to Japan or California or whatever. We really just want to supply our community of Gatesville with the best nutrition. That we can. No, I, I think that's super important. So that like, look, local serve your local area. Yeah, yeah. it's like the um, John from Amber Oaks Ranch. Yeah, like he he's gotten inquiries. Like, hey, how do I buy from you? Like from people in other states. He's like, yeah, you know, I I, I appreciate it, but. You know, support your local rancher. Like I, yeah. I, I deal around here. <laughs> yeah, that's what we do. We get a lot of questions, and people are like, "Hey, like I, I, we want to buy raw milk, but we live next Y and Z, and can you ship it to us?" And I'm like, "No, but so we can, but it's not very cheap." Well, no, we can't ship it. Period. But and I'm not going to because I want them to go and support their local dairy. I want then there's a wonderful website. I think it's called like realdilk.com where you can actually put in your zip code and it'll bring up all the grade A raw dairies around. And I always give them that like some like support your local farmer. Like, please. Uh, yeah, what was, please. what was that site again? Uh, it's, I think it's called realmilk.com. Let me look it up real quick. I sent it to one of my Yep. Friends. Raw milk finder. Awesome. There you go. Yeah, that's a that's a good one to have. Thank you. Definitely, and I, I share that with I try to share that with as many people because we do get a lot of inquiries about getting raw milk, and I'm just like I would love to help you, but I want you to support your local there. Right. Plus, I just think shipping raw milk would be a little bit of a I don't even know how you do that. Right. I don't know. 
I know what it is. I know, but I want them to have that, like, I want them to have the raw milk experience where it's been milked that day or the day before and then drink it and from the gal, yeah. you can go off and pet. Like, right. Yeah. It's all about was, chicken with your local people. That's right. Was there anything else that you guys wanted to touch on or mention? No, we covered the community park. Uh, and then the other, other question were, oh, yeah, where do you get most of your materials? Craigslist. Yeah. You know, the sort of source materials up Craigslist, if you don't have a lot of money, that's where we built a lot of our stuff. Yeah, you can find yeah. nice on there. They literally, the when we're in our third of an acre property in Austin, the 33 raised garden beds, 100% resourced from Craigslist. Yeah, the amazing wood too. It came off of like a 200 year old barn that they had taken apart. So we got all that like thick, good logs for free. You know? Wow. We're still got them. We brought them with us. Yeah. So like I was paying them. It's a pay the move. But we also gave all the dirt away for free for uh, a local community garden. Nice. Yeah. I was yeah. like, I don't want to take the dirt with me, but if you all take the dirt, that'll be awesome. And I'll just take the box. <laughs> Yeah, I still browse Craigslist because I don't have Facebook, and my wife browses Facebook because she just doesn't like. Uh... It's the opposite for us. I'm on Craigslist every morning, and he's on Facebook Market. We're just like, at oh. least, at least yeah. you got it covered, right? Oh yeah. That's right. Well, hey, uh, I've really appreciated this. Co- like you guys joining me tonight. Um, this has been an awesome conversation. I learned a lot and had a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I am Matt DeRosier of Farm Hop Life. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and visit farmhoplife.com. Inside of the city, the people are crazy. Out of their minds, they ain't got a clue. We gone away, headed west for Montana. Left family and friends, all I got now is you. We both got new jobs, a house and a homestead, thinking this was the life, all that there'd be. After our firstborn, you had to stay home. That's when the work got in the way for me. Well, I started farm hop life. You'll come to your farm to help and to want. Me and the family, a truck and an RV, send us a message and there will